Hello and welcome to this wonderful virtual event. We are so grateful to have Shadow Mountain hosting us and we hope that as we wait here for a few minutes that you will be able to join us live if you're watching this conversation later uh, on rebroadcast. We hope that you will feel the spirit and enthusiasm of the conversation Heather and I are going to have today. I'm Gaydalyn Condi. I am the host and have been asked to participate in this event. And I'm so honored to be a part of anything that is connected to Heather, because if you have read anything from her, you will know of her great talent and heart. And so I feel very honored to share this virtual platform and this conversation, especially because of what we're going to talk about. But before we jump into that, while we're waiting for people to to join us live, sometimes it takes a little bit to to get uh, all the signals out there. Um, I just wanted to read the quick little official bio intro of Heather Moore. Here's what people say of her, and then we're going to learn more personally because we get this chance together. Heather is a USA Today bestselling author and award-winning author with more than 70 publications. She's lived on both the East and the West Coast of the United States, including Hawaii, and attending school abroad, including the Cairo American College in Egypt and the Anglican School of, Jer of Jerusalem in Israel. She loves to learn about anything in history and as an author is passionate about historical research, which from the conversation that you will see today, it is going to be a lot of that, a lot of heart and history and probably maybe a few emotions. I'm going to do full warning to our viewers that I tend to have my emotions close and this book um, doesn't um, hold back in the emotion department. And so I'm excited, Heather. Thanks for joining us today and, and doing this official celebration of The Paper Daughters of Chinatown. And it's such a beautiful book and I can't wait to talk with you. How you doing, Heather? Doing great. I'm so glad you could join me as well. When I was thinking of someone who would be a perfect co-host, co you were the first one that came to mind. And so thank you so much. Um, and not to toot your horn, but to toot it anyway, is you're an amazing author and I've admired you for a long time. So I'm really, I feel blessed to be able to share this space with you today because I know that um, we'll have a great conversation and the most important things will come out about the book. Thank you. And thank you for trusting me with this because as an author, I do know that each of my books feel like a part of my soul walking around outside of my body on the planet. And so it's a very personal experience and you have, you have published and created a massive body of work. Um, and, and so why don't we, before we kind of dive into the paper daughters specifically, mm -hmm. how do you feel after this many books and the experience specifically with this latest one that allows you to keep pulling from that place of inspiration? I know that's kind of a cliche question that is asked of authors, but, um, specifically with historical fiction, I think there's a unique beauty to that. It's one of my favorite genres ever. If I have to choose to not be writing and working myself, that's what I would rather read because I like to read true stories. Where do you pull from that next book inside your soul? Yeah, I mean, I'm the same as you. I love historical fiction. I love to learn from the past, from our ancestors, from issues and situations and cultures before us. And so when I'm looking at writing a historical novel, um, I kind of think, okay, well, has this been told before? Or is it really just something that's a paragraph in a textbook? Or can this story really come to life? Um, so that's probably one of the considerations I take into. Um, I've done a lot of historical fiction. My first published book was a historical series. And then since then, I've, I've done contemporary and other genres. But I just keep coming back to the historical. I think it's because I, I enjoy the research and I feel like I'm learning and growing from the past. And it's the same with my reading choices. Most of my books that I read are probably historical fiction. Um, I don't know what it is. I think just I think just having that connection to the past and feeling like we've come this far or even understanding why why do we think the way we do today? Why do we act the way we do? And then you can kind of see generations before us what led their sacrifices before us. There's 
um, important choices before us. There are a lot of brave people before us. And it also gives me a little bit of hope during harder days because I think, wow, if, if this guy could survive a concentration camp or this woman could stand before a jury in 1895 and stand up for you know these Chinese girls that weren't even citizens, I'm like, you know, maybe I can get through my hard day. So they, they've become like a personal inspiration to me, which I need on a daily basis. You know what, Heather, that's so great to feel the spirit of our hearts talking because that's exactly what I was going to say, especially 2020. If, yeah. you, if you need a big dose of inspiration and like in a way that kind of says, you know what, we are going through some really hard times at 2020. I don't think that those that lived through the late 1800s um, would look at our time and say, hey, you guys are, why are you making a big deal about this COVID thing? That's no big deal because we are dealing with some very unique challenges. But I love your idea of that when we look at history, I know more than once over the last few months, I have thought of World War II and the stories I've read of specifically women because I'm a wife and a mother and working and and, and I've seen a number of true stories play out in film and in, in literature that have reminded me, like others before me have done these, these challenging things and re preserved a part of their spirit and heart without becoming hardened. And I think this story for sure um, elevates that conversation and it wasn't a, an era, a story. I felt almost embarrassed because I grew up in Northern California and I spent many weekends in Chinatown. And I felt like the whole time I was reading, I almost felt like I had to atone for the fact that I didn't know this story. Did you feel that way, Heather? Did you, because I love what you said as an author, you look at kind of what's already been done and you're thinking, where's the gap? Was this a, a, a story you had any idea had happened? Did you have any connection to it? What what brought you specifically to this for our, for our viewers? This is late 1800s Chinatown, and it's the story of of sex slavery and sex trafficking um, in, in Chinatown in in Northern California. Did you know about it before, or or like me, were you like? Um, shock that you didn't know? So I think I knew on the surface, like I knew in general that um, I had read a book years ago that was set actually up in Seattle where kind of the similar thing was happening. It happened all on that coast. And so I just, you know, and it's a great historical novel, but then I moved on. Like it didn't really just, it didn't really impact me in the way that researching this story did. And you're not alone. In fact, I have um, friends and acquaintances in the San Francisco area that have grown up there, lived there for many, many years that, that this story is not told in universities and um, in general. And so um, I remember when, when I started talking about this with my publisher and we were, we were kind of working together, trying to find you know, a, a historical story with a woman that, that made a lot of change in progression and in her era. And so when she came up, I looked her up and I, I just read the surface, again, the surface. Oh, she worked in a mission home. She helped um, educate these, these girls that came to the mission home after they you know, had been slaves or, or prostitutes. But I had no idea <laughs> what, what had, was under the surface. And, um, and I, I could say I didn't know what I was getting into, um, but even if, even if I had known, I still would have done it. In fact, I, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll research and work on this book in the morning. You know, my kids are at school basically from eight to two. And then early afternoon, I'll work on maybe kind of more a contemporary, light, lighthearted type story. But I was literally out of emotional energy. I couldn't pull up a lighthearted story. Um, it, it was, and it wasn't necessarily the writing, it was the research because you could only put so much. I knew the book was gonna be around 300 pages and I had to decide, okay, I'm gonna cover one year of her life, you know, her entire career, 40 years, you know, when am I gonna cover? When I decided to do, I selected 13 years because that was right, be, right when the mission home was burned down because of the San Francisco earthquake. And then it took him two years to rebuild. So the final scene 
is, you know, the rebuilding and, and rededication and kind of that new hope and that new energy. Um, but I obviously researched her whole life and so many things that she went through and, um, and also, and also writing for an audience where you're not going to be, um, you're going to understand what's going on, but you're not going to be dragged down and actually feel like you're part of the darkness because, because something's in, in, in this, you know, in these situations were really dark. So I wanted to keep that light and the inspiration. Um, but I just read things that were just really, really hard to read and things I, I won't, um, you know, I'll never forget. But uh, I think that just knowing that every day for Donaldina Cameron, who was the one that um, the story focuses on, her work at the mission home, many days it was awful. Um, many times you take one step forward and go three steps back the next day. And so we have the advantage of looking at her life as a whole and thinking, wow, she was so amazing. She did all this work. Um, she, she was, you know, inspired. She was uplifted. You know, the Lord was, was with her side by side all the time. Um, so we look at it with a bird's eye view, but through the research, she had, she had more than one breakdown. She had to take certain breaks. Um, she doubted all the time. She, she questioned, um, she had anxiety and depression and, um, but it just shows you that, that even if you are so overwhelmed, sometimes if you just get it, get through the end of the day, it's fine. So Heather, <laughs> you went like inside my heart and brain just now because that's why um, the Paper Daughters has been a gift and timely in my life. And and Dolly is, is the main character that you're talking about. Um, and I think, you know, not to equate what I'm trying to do to help make the world better to what she did, but I love, I love that you did not shy away from the really hard underbelly mm -hmm. of the darkness of this experience in this world. But I also appreciate it as an author that you didn't Hollywoodize it, which is exactly that's, I don't know another way to describe what Hollywood sometimes does. They sensationalize the horrific. It's horrific enough. Right. Um, there's specific areas where you talk and you just describe one of the characters who thinks that she's coming to America to be married and she's the age of my daughter. And she so loves her mom and my daughter loves me. And so she's standing there and she's told to take off her clothes and she's still trying to make her brain match what these people that have lied to her mother and taken her to America have said this whole time. And I just, I appreciated so much that you took us there, but you didn't like, mm -hmm. you didn't over traumatize the reader. And I guess that's, I think so important. It, this story deserves to be told in the hard truth, but thank you for also infusing this sense of like, Where's Dolly and me? Where's, mm -hmm. where's the Dolly inside of me that I love what you said is that we often judge our own lives by that day, by that hour. And yet most of the time when we're reading scripture or historical fiction or anything inspirational, we're taking the complete body of someone's life. And sometimes we're seeing it in a short few chapters and we don't see the day in day out of like, go to Walmart, you know, try yeah. to get the dog to the groomer, try to pay the bills and your own self doubts. And if yeah. we look at Dolly, can I just read really quick page 90, chapter eight? There's yeah. an excerpt from her, from the mission home report. And she says, we do not always walk crowned with Laurel. Tis not enough to help the feeble brother rise, but to comfort him after this, we find the greatest responsibility of our mission work with simple faithfulness. Therefore, let us go forward looking to God for our pattern then weave it into human life. Thus will the world become better. And when I read that, it was like an answer to one of my prayers, like, 
like we're just trying we're trying to partner with god and whether it's online schooling whether it's writing books whether it's rescuing girls from sex trafficking like the the power of one i'm going to say women but there were some amazing men that were a support right. specifically i'm thinking of the police officer um <laughs> that that we are making a difference how did you not go into that dark place um with everything that you've read where have you put it because i know for authors books live on for for you know a part of your soul right so where yeah. where have you put it after all that um, you've read? i i think honestly what what has helped me is i did all my writing research in the mornings so it could kind of like filter through me so i could sleep at night like if i was working at night i would not be sleeping um and another thing i think that helped me is i put together a soundtrack on spotify and it just it was just some of it was um is actually scottish music because she was scottish um but a lot of it was just inspirational either instrumental or just something that is that just really felt like I could have the right spirit of her life um, as part of the writing and music. The music was uplifting. So it kept me kind of on that higher plane. And um, and it and I think that that just really helped me like with the emotional side of it. And like like you said, you know, not to be so weighed down and just to the point where I mean, part. I mean, part of writing historical fiction can be really intimidating because you're you're doing a rendition of, of someone's life and their trials and their challenges and their triumphs, and and there could be a scholar out there, other historians out there that just know so much more than you do. And I had quite a few nonfiction books and quite a few sources I went through, um, a first-hand accounts, and so I, I felt like they were all on my shoulders. So I have to literally do a pet talk and say, it's okay. It's historical fiction and I have great editors that can look at it. The supportive publisher is not just me. Um, and even though right now I feel like the whole weight is on me, that is not really on me. Just this process right now is what I'm in charge of. It's interesting you would frame it that way, Heather, because I think that's how we all are. You know, when you talk to, I'm the oldest in my family and mm -hmm. I tell the story of my childhood and my siblings that are younger have a different version of that. And so I think there is a burden with historical fiction. I just read a, a historical fiction book series during a, a certain era, era of polygamy. And it's like, you know, you don't have, I just interviewed TC Christensen and he does historical fiction on film, right? right? And so he's like, nothing in the dialogue is there. You know, I have to take this event and this event and then put the dialogue between of how, how is that going to inter change happen and how are we going to get this character to move to this position in the story with with without jeopardizing the the validity of the story and I, and obviously i didn't i didn't do a side by side research cuz i just appreciate a historical fiction author and so i just mm -hmm. take their gift and i say hey this is their version of the story but i wonder if this is a really good place to jump into some of our behind the scenes treats for the viewers and we have quite a few um, that are joining us live. And I would, I would love for you guys to consider any questions you have for Heather, but Heather brought some pictures to share with us, which would allow us to kind of frame the, the conversation around maybe some of the characters in the book and any, anything that um, you want to share, Heather, do you want to go there? Should we, we bring up the picture? Yeah. yeah. So let's go with the first picture. Um, and we can talk about that. So this one shows, so Donald Dina Cameron, she's in the middle, and this is some of her mission home staff. So there were a lot of um, women that would volunteer at the mission home, but Donald Dina as, or I'll, I'll call her Dolly because I call her that throughout the book. So Dolly um, lived at the mission home and also other staff members did as well. And um, the staff members included teachers and interpreters. So for instance, when they would go on rescues, uh, they would, um, Dolly didn't speak Chinese. Um, she would start to learn it obviously, so she could communicate better. Um, but a lot of these these girls, they were afraid. And um, even though they had sent out a call for help, um, all of a sudden this uh, very tall white woman, Donald, I think Dolly was 5'9 or 5'10, which of course would have been very tall in Chinatown. 
and um, and she spoke English. And in fact, on the ships coming over, they called the high bind the high binders of the tongue. They would warn them. They called her the white devil. Said you have to watch out for the white devil because she will take you to her house and poison you. Yeah. And so some of these girls were petrified. So she would have one of her staff members with her, and they would they would um, translate and they would speak Chinese and they would help help the girl um, feel safe and and we're not going to harm you. You're going to be safe. And um, anyway, and then later on after after kind of my book takes place. Um, there was a, so kind of what, so the kind of the beginning of the story, it really is wild, wild west, where a girl would send a note to be rescued and then Dolly would bring her staff with her and they would have a couple of police officers with them and they'd literally break down doors and windows and rescue these girls. Well, eventually laws were put into place and so Dolly had to get lawyers, the slave owners got lawyers and so it became court battles um and so the girls that ran away or got rescued then they would have to go to court over who they belong to so just for our viewers that maybe haven't read the book yet the the women that you describe in the book were they in that picture her translators were those the characters that you spotlight um yeah so some of them are um so we have a cheng in there and tian fu wu and then um, there's some other ones that are also mentioned in the book. But you have to also understand that not they didn't just show up to the mission home and say, I want to be a translator. These these are women that also were rescued women and which is staff, yeah. which is phenomenal part of yeah. the story, like the resiliency of spirit. And and I, I love men. So please understand, I don't mean this next statement to be negative towards men, but the power of women is so profound in this story and during an era where women weren't necessarily able to hold office mm -hmm. hold property own property you know i mean if you think about the limited legal power of women especially a single woman i, I think that's such a, a a back story to this whole thing of of the the influence of one woman and the and the hope that can come with change um I, I love seeing her face and I love, yeah. you know, I love that you pointed out that she had this nickname that just, I remember when I read that part of the book, I was like, yes, you know, um, because they were scared of her. They were yeah. scared of this woman that was not, not stopping, even though they, not to ruin the story for those that haven't read it, they do some, the Tong do some horrific, they're the, you would call them what? The, they're games the, basically. The, yeah, yeah, the Chinese mafia or... Yeah, yeah. And they controlled everything in Chinatown. I think right. another part of this story that's important is, is at the time, the immigration laws, and I don't want to get too political here, but there were so many times I wanted to call you and, and, and say, okay, what are your thoughts on immigration laws now? Because you see these same patterns playing out where they're, right. trying, to, they're trying to investigate these new immigrants and there's no women in Chinatown. And this is the way they've gotten them in there. They fabricated the, the title comes from the paper daughters is they fabricated these documents with false names and stories to get them into the, the country. And then they're in the underbelly of prostitution and opium and all of that. What, what do you want to say on that? Or do we have a picture that maybe would help you talk? Um, let's go, let's go to the next picture and just see which one that is. If I could also address okay. what you're asking. Great. So, um, so basically what, what you're asking is, is kind of like what spearheaded like the prostitution trade. So, so one of the things is that when the opium wars were over, um, a lot of people in China were devastated and they were looking for jobs. And so they would, so these Chinese men, they would come over to America and they work on the railroads and work in the mines. Um, but because of population control and not having enough finances to bring over their families, they just came by themselves. Well, in 1882, the Anti-Chinese um, anti Immigration Act was passed, which meant that you couldn't come over to America unless you qualified in certain ways. And so this prevented them from bringing their families over. So now you have a bachelor society and very, very small percentage of Chinese women, and it's illegal for a Chinese man to marry 
someone of another race. And so they don't even have the option to marry if they wanted to. And so then, so then these criminal gangs, they, uh, they found that this is an opportunity, a commercial opportunity to provide um, relations, relations with women and through brothels or also just a housekeeper or a servant to cook for them. And so they bring over these young girls. Um, and so basically they would pay the family a few hundred dollars and then they would bring them to America, but they, they're able to sell them for a lot more, sometimes 10 times more. So here's an example. Um, this is actually uh, from 1898 and it was found at a Salvation Army in a coat pocket. And as you can see, it's a bill of sale. And it says in there that there's a girl that was being sold for $250. And that's probably on the low end. Um, some of these girls, especially if they felt like they could make a lot of money off of them, they're sold for maybe $1,000 up to $5,000. So as you can see that this became a, a, a trade, a commodity. And um, and they're, and just like you mentioned that these criminal gangs, they were kind of like the mafia is they were fights and there were um, assassinations going on and they would fight over certain girls and it was um, kind of a dangerous place to be. Um, in fact, in the story, we have one of those fights that goes on. I think the other part of this story that can't be, you mentioned the opium wars and, and I think if you don't understand opium, what did you learn about in research about opium? And, and that's what they immediately do. I think one of the most heart-wrenching um, <laughs> scenes, like I knew I was going to get emotional talking about this, but is they would get these girls addicted to mm -hmm. opium. And you can see why out of just such mercy, you're like, of course, you're going to want to do drugs to survive because yeah. the effect of opium allowed them to like escape. But then th there's certain characters where Dolly like rescues them, but they need their fix and they're in horrible withdrawals and they've spent years. What did you learn about opium and what do you want to say about that? Um, yeah. So that's always something fun to Google, right? <laughs> Is opium. And, and so, so it's, it's a uh, pretty easy to get addicted to. So within a couple of days, um, you'd have, they would be addicted. Um, and it was also used as, as controlling. And in fact, if you research human trafficking today, um, a lot of times drugs are involved. Yeah. It, is that your brain literally gets addicted to a drug and um, and you're not yourself because a lot of times you look at someone that has an addiction and you think, why can't you just stop? Or why don't you wanna stop? Or why are you choosing that drug over me? They're, they're literally fighting for their life by taking that drug because if they go off that drug, they feel like I'm gonna like, die know, crazy in my mind or I'm gonna literally die. So. Um, and I'm so, glad you yeah. said that because that's the exact impression I had as I read that it felt like it showed the the backstory and we have no idea. I mean, maybe we're meeting people that are addicted to drugs today that have no history with sex trafficking, mm -hmm. but they've had other trauma and yeah. that is what they've, you know, we all have a drug of choice. We all have a place yeah. we go to numb and many people during covid you know, have not had that access or they've had too much access of their drug of choice, whether it's shopping or pornography or whatever. And so I loved the the empathy that grew inside my heart because I felt like I always was very empathetic. But if you love someone that's addicted and you're like, I don't get why you're choosing this drug or alcohol or porn or whatever it is over your family, you can see that play out in very real time mm -hmm. in your book. Very. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's not a choice. And they, I mean, we think it's a choice, but it's, it's, they're basically choosing to survive, which means staying addicted. So, yeah. Do we have another picture that we want to yeah, pop up? There? Next one. So this oh. is the, this is the mission home today. In fact, um, it's still in the same location. Oh. Um, it's a 920 Sacramento street. And I went there last year with my daughter and we got to take a tour and it still is a community center. Um, they have youth counseling, they have support groups, um, they have camps that go on and they do a lot of community activities for Chinese Americans that live in the area. Um, so this is rebuilt from 1908. And what happened is, is when the earthquake hit San Francisco, it was, 
it wasn't damaged, just the chimney was kind of damaged, I guess. Um, but then, but then they started the fire. So, that, so they tried to, um, so they tried to create a fire break with Chinatown. So they burned Chinatown um, to break the fire that was coming up, so they could protect the more wealthy neighborhoods, like on Knob Hill. Um, but it backfired. No pun intended. Um, so then the mission home ended up burning down. So if you can look close enough, the dark bricks that are protruding, those are original bricks that were burned. Wow. So original bricks um, when they completed this. And it's five levels. Uh, Donald Dina Cameron's room is still there. She's up in one of the tiny corner rooms and she could look out over San Francisco in Chinatown. Um, but uh, there's, there's not bars today, but back then they used to have bars on the window, the lower levels um, to protect the house. And there's still the underground tunnel in wow. there. And um, sometimes when a slave owner would realize his slave had been stolen, he would go to the house with a police officer and he would say, she stole a bracelet from my house. And so then they would have a search warrant. They would search the house. Well, Donaldina, um, she would ring this little gong that would sound up to the upstairs room so the girls would know that someone was at the house. And then she had, I think, seven deadbolts on the door. And so she would lock, unlock each one really slowly, so it would give the girl that needed to hide time to go all the way in the basement. And you think, well, why didn't they just go in the basement and look? Well, some of them have had superstitions that demons lived in the basement, so they wouldn't go in the basement. But then that meant the um, little Chinese girl that was hiding there, she was also petrified. <laughs> but, um, and sometimes the girls were taken and sometimes they, they were recaptured by the owners. And um, and so Donaldina started, started to work with a legal system to get guardianship papers. She had it, so she got on a rescue one night, the next day she's already at court trying to get these guardianship papers secured. Um, so that she had a legal right to have these girls at the home. Wow. I love the, in, the inspiration of keeping those original bricks. What a, that feels like a very modern approach to memorializing. And I'm so glad that that was done. Um, I love, we already have one question from our friend, Jen Johnson. And so okay. I'm going to throw it out here because it may come up in the pictures. If you don't feel like it fits with what we're talking about, um, she wants to know which character, if you were to choose yourself to be one of the characters in this story, who would you, I know, I'm going to give you time to think about that if you want to think about that. I, I don't know if we have a picture of the Mrs. Fields. Um, not a mission field. We, we can show the next picture. I don't have one of Mrs. Fields though. Yeah, and but, we're not um, talking the cookie giant. We're talking, uh, if you haven't watched, read the book yet, you, know, you Mrs. Field is the character that that we always need to have in every story which is not the evil person but it's this protagonist almost right. person that is a really great juxtapose i think personal um profile compared to who dolly is is that how you would describe her yeah definitely so thankfully mrs field was there short term um and to answer jen's question i would not want to be her if i had to be a <laughs> character i think I don't know. I'd probably just take the easy way out and be someone on the board and raising uh -huh. funds. But I don't know. I mean, that's a really good question. I'd probably have to think about that for a little bit. Well, Heather, I know you're too humble to say that you would be Dolly, but I I could definitely see you as one of one of the um, helper interpreter people that like, no, this is how we're going to do it. And this is what they're feeling. And this is what the culture is. And maybe this is how we help this girl because I've been there. Maybe you'd be one of those. I don't think you're so removed. You can't do the work and the writing that you've done and, and sit on the board. Come on. I, I go to the court. I go help you a court advocate maybe. Okay. I think that's but, yeah. such a powerful part of the story too, because it exhausts me. Just, I have to pace myself through the book a little bit because you do such a brilliant job as a writer pulling you into the story, but you're there. Like I made the mistake of reading right before bed. And then I told you, I messaged you the other day, I'm dreaming all night long of rescuing girls. And yeah. you know, um, they're not always turning out the way I, I want them to. So we can go to the next picture, but I think that's a really great question, Jen. Um, so this is the, 
this is part of the San Francisco police squad and they were called the Chinatown squad. And they became really close to Dolly so she could just call them um, or send a message before they had phones installed. And she would say, I'm going on a rescue. Many times it was at midnight in the middle of the night and they would come with her because these places she went literally were not safe, um, especially as a single woman um, with her Chinese interpreter. Um, as you can see, they're holding sledgehammers and axes. And so it just kind of gives you an idea of the Wild Wild West um, version of the story in the beginning where they were knocking on doors and the doors weren't answered. They would literally break them down and bring these girls out. Um, the girls a lot of times would send a message to Dolly by they'd send their address, which, and then they would send like a torn piece of cloth. And that torn piece of cloth would match what they had so that Dolly could match up and make sure she got the right girl when she went in. They usually had to be pretty quick. I love that we pulled this picture up just as Melissa asked about the police officers and how she, she says on the comments that she kept thinking about them while reading the book and how um, this affected their lives, their personal lives and working in this, in this era. And I was thinking about the fact, and, and she commented on how you portrayed their emotions. And I just watched an interview with um, someone else that is still doing sex trafficking and rescues. And he was talking about how passionate he feels about not defunding the police for this exact reason, because he almost portrayed exactly the same scenario you I had just read in your book, where yeah. they get word, they know where a girl is, they show up at the hotel, but the person has gotten word as well. They have no legal right to bust down the door. And right. so he's like, listen, we have police force that are already stretched thin. We need to have, we don't have, every police force doesn't have a special task force. In your research, did you get an, a sense of how massive the police force was in that area? And what, like, were there certain individuals assigned specifically? What, what did you learn mm -hmm. about the police force? Yeah, so in the police force, um, so they had the, so that was a actual name, the Chinatown Squad. And there was like maybe six or seven men in the group. And they were the ones that were assigned to go and address these, these calls for help. And so, you know, which is, which is really nice because Donald Dina certainly needed that help. Um, the other interest, interesting thing is sometimes they were also the same man that came to the house with the slave owner to serve the warrant for a search. And so that was also hard is they were there thinking, this is the last place I want to be is to rescue this girl. Um, but in the early 1900s, when they didn't have all these different laws in place, um, there's a story in Officer Cook, and this is a true story, and, and it's kind of alluded to a little bit in the book, but the character Tian, or Tian Fu Wu, um, she was about 10 years old, and the officer noticed he could see how she could see a, evidence of abuse when he saw her out, like, just, you know, sweeping the, sweeping the street or whatever in front of her the little place she lived. And so he literally snatched her and brought her to the mission home. So some of, some of those early stories are of a police officer taking that initiative and saying, I'm going to help you. There's no child protective services back then. And so it really was up to the citizens to watch out for each other. But when you have a, a group of people that don't have citizenship, okay, well, who is, even if there was child protective services, um, are they really going to go and help people that they're not being paid to help or they feel obligated to help? Um, and, I, and I wondered about the cultural, I mean, I think you can look in a lot of historical stories, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's the Mormon pioneers to um, the immigration stories playing out now, which those history books haven't been written yet, mm -hmm. to Chinatown, right? Where there's an infusion of a group of people to a, an, an established community and the right. And the resistance, right? Because right. all of a sudden we're like, wait, why are they taking over? And you've alluded a little bit to the fact that that influenced the immigration laws and policies, which fed the fuel or fueled the fire of sex trafficking that happened. It, it, it fascinated me to feel that their hearts, these men that were serving as the police officers wanted to help this community because that wasn't, that wasn't everybody, you know, there oh, was, no. yeah. In fact, in fact, when they when they first started um, looking for a location for the mission home, so they knew there was a need, and um, so basically they first rented just a couple of rooms, like at the top of a building, 
and they and they went and they approached various landlords and landlords were like i don't want those chinese in my building and so even on sacramento street in those areas above chinatown there are people that didn't even want them in the neighborhoods and so finally they were able to um, rent one place but the landlord made them come up the back stairs they shouldn't want them coming up the front stairs and so that's why they finally were able to raise enough funds to have their own building then nobody could turn them away wow um do we have a few more pictures that you want to yeah let's go to the next one wow so this is um an example of an rescue and you can see Don that's donaldina cameron at the bottom and this was for a newspaper article so this is staged um just so you know but this is um just a typical alley in chinatown back then and it just showed that they would go up ladders they'd break down doors or whatever and they would bring out the girls um a lot of time they're they were starving they're addicted to something and um, they weren't healthy they had lice and all kinds of things going on um and so you see donald dean on the left and then one of her interpreters next to her wow that's amazing yeah that's amazing Okay, what, what picture do we have next? Um, so, so this is one of Donaldina, like this is after she retired and, and the Occidental Mission Home for Girls is now renamed the Cameron House after Dolly Cameron. And that's Tian, Tian Fu Wu. <laughs> if you haven't want, read the book, you don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> but. I think this story is so tender because whether you're rescuing a kid or you're trying to raise your own teenager that's resistant to your love, like I just, I loved this story and I loved how she didn't stop trying. And you know, that pushback that we feel as teachers, as parents, as right, when, when the kids that we're trying to love are just like so angry and if we have, parents that are joining us that are have adopted children that struggle with that bonding and and or or even foster parents i think what a profound part of this story i love i love this picture what a sweet picture yeah what do you so, want to say that you couldn't put in the book about both of these women so so tian she was young when she was rescued probably around 10 9 or 10 um when dolly came um, Tian had been, was a little girl. Dolly was 25, so Dolly was older. And um, Tian did not like Dolly at all. So she, uh, she didn't trust adults. Um, she liked the director okay, but there is one interpreter that Tian had really bonded with, um, you know, who was, a, who was another Chinese lady. And so it took a few years, um, probably until Tian was a young teenager, for her and Dolly to grow close. And then, and then once they did, Tian just became the fiercest advocate, like like the the person that would do anything for Dolly. Um, and she really wanted to stay at the mission home and, and keep working out. A lot of the girl, a lot of the girls and women would would go to school and they'd move on with their lives. They'd get married. Um, sometimes they they went back to China and were reunited, reunited with, with their families. Um, Tian did go to back to China one time. Um, she could never locate her family again. But she did go back east to Pennsylvania to college there. She had a sponsor. And so because she wanted to be more educated, she wanted to be stronger. She wanted to um, be an asset to the mission home. And so that so she did that. She she got a four year degree and she came back and she worked in the mission home until she retired. And then she was actually in the hospital with Dolly when Dolly passed away. So so um, they remain really close friends. And um, I think my one of my favorite parts of the book is to see that relationship develop because we, agree. we can all relate to that, right? Yep. Either our own kids or someone in our family or someone that we're really trying to reach out to. Well, and I also I've said this as in in various platforms that sometimes the wedge we feel in a relationship is exactly where God wants us to lean in. And our response as humans is to lean out like we want to run. From that yeah. thing. And I kept cheering for Dolly as she kept trying to navigate what's another approach to connect with Tian. What's another way in which I can soften her heart and help her feel safe. And she just kept trying, but not over trying. And I think that's the dance. And, and I often feel Feel like if we don't lean into that we miss out on potentially some of our dearest relationships because 
there, people are mean and hurt yeah. people hurt people. And you know why Tian is being mean, but you're just cheering for her, both of them to like keep trying. And so what a tender picture to look at. I, I love seeing, seeing that relationship as well. It was one of my favorite parts as well. Yeah. Okay. So if we have any, I don't know how many more pictures we have, cause I don't have that screen in front of me, but I think they're just such extra gifts. Oh, this is, so this is Tan when she's younger. So, oh, wow. and, and she, wow. really, so she was considered, um, I think, so she was very pretty and she was considered, I think rosy faced or something. There's like a couple descriptions in there. Um, but she also got death threats. So when she started working as interpreter and going on rescues, um, the Chinese people felt like that she, or not the people, but the criminals, they felt like she had turned on her own people. Yes. Um, and so they would, but she just had that strong spirit, that stubborn spirit where it didn't face her at all. Um, and she was happy to literally put her life on the line sometimes and keep, keep supporting the work. I think it's one of the themes as well that I think give relevance to what we see what we may not know, but is happening now with, with sex trafficking and other series is a relationship of abuse is where the girls were threatened that if, you know, your ancestors will curse your parents, your parents will die. You see the shame stories play out where the girls are like, I can't go back because I've, I'm, I've been a prostitute. My family will reject me. And, and I think that's still a technique of, of, perpetrators today is to threaten and scare the the victim into believing that they're forever broken and that that harm's going to come to their family. I know Elizabeth Smart has talked right. openly about that exact mm -hmm. that she was taken what just a few yards away from her home but immediately was afraid because there was a threat to her family. Right. Yeah, def I mean that shame can just be so powerful. You think of things that we might have shame over, you know, you do that hundredfold with these girls and they don't, they don't want to see the light of day. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, can I just share also a quote? I, I think it's page 80 and I thought it just did a beautiful um, description of what we've already touched on is that no matter what your mission is, once you've made a commitment to do it, it doesn't mean that it's easy. And I think this is where, um, maybe I don't have it marked correctly. I think it was her commitment. She had already, this is Dolly, and, and this is where there, there's a discussion about, not to ruin the story, because I'm trying to be careful for those that haven't read it, um, a discussion about her staying and her commitment to stay. And she said she had already committed herself to this work. So putting her future into the Lord's hands was all she could do now. Come what may, her work would go forward, threats and all, as long as she was able. And I think the whole rest of the book shows um, that, that I think all the great heroes of, of the world have have that decision to make initially, but then they almost have to just like all of us choose back into it. Right. Because the walls keep coming and the hard opposition, the games of each side were upped. Right. And she could have quit at various places. Um, in our last minute or two, before we maybe ask for any other questions that people have, what do you want to say about Dolly that, you know, you did 13 years in this book, but what, what about Dolly do you know and, and feel that maybe the reader um, needs to make sure they know that you know as the author? Um, I think a little bit what I said before is, um, is in the book we see her do all these amazing things and there are, and we do see some of the setbacks. Um, so I don't want, I don't want us to compare ourselves to her and think, you know, well, you know, I can never do something like that. Cause, cause we, we honestly, we can do those similar kinds of things, maybe not in the exact same environment or exact same um, type of things, but um, we all are in our own homes. We're all in our own, lives, our jobs, our families. Um, and I, I think the biggest key I learned from Donaldina is, 
is if you read the Beatitudes, um, I feel like she, by the end of her life, not, not her first day at the mission home, but by the end of her, her wonderful life is she worked hard to achieve all those. I mean, you think of just blessed are, are they that mourn, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, she felt all of those. And um, so, so she was, a, she's an example to me as far as living her truth and um, listening to what her path needs to be and just continually pushing forward. Um, not every day, she wasn't able to climb a mountain every day, um, maybe not even every week, but if she looked back year after year, and I think we could all do this, um, you know, she looked for the tender mercy, she celebrated the small victories, she grieved over the ones that were hard. Um, I think one of the things that really touched me is in her, in the ledgers that they keep for the mission home, is she would write down, you know, the date, the name of the person they rescued, you know, kind of the details of the rescue. And if, and if the woman ended up changing her mind, she always left a blank space. Um, this was in hopes that that woman would, whether she came back to the mission home, but, or had to find another path, that it would still be a success story. Um, so she always left that blank space. And, and I, I think that just taught me a lot of compassion is if, is if you have a loved one with, with a serious addiction or, um, you know, like, like you don't, you have that knocking heads all the time, kind of like Dolly and Tan did in the beginning. Um, if you always just leave your heart open, leave that blank space, um, then you will find through inspiration ways to fill it. And that's really all I can say about her. There's, there's a lot more. Um, but. <laughs> no, that's, I think Heather, that's so beautiful. We had it. We, we have opportunities through books, I think better than any other medium to have the spirit teach us whether your faith, no matter what it is that I think written word has a way of reaching a part of our soul and like nudging it and pricking it just a little bit to consider a different way. And I know I had that experience in reading this book and um, I feel like Dolly's a new um, example and teacher to me when I feel that resistance or that frustration or that discouragement or that your investment is not received because she, she would work and sacrifice to rescue. And I love you spotlighting the idea that she always left room for hope. And isn't that the message we all need that there's, there's hope for all of us. Um, if you could continue, I, I want to pull a couple of questions before we end and we have time maybe for two, but, um, there, this is kind of a combination uh, Shaylin and Amy both asked basically about if there's a character in the book that you could continue a story in another book. And then Shaylin asked it after you sent the book to the editor, um, did you worry about how the reader was going to handle this set, this intense story? I'm assuming you wrestled with that the whole time because you were doing the research yourself. And, and I feel like there was such an infusion of inspiration and reality, right? It was, it was right. not, it was not all just reality and it wasn't just like vanilla sanit sanitizing Dolly and these characters to where they weren't human as well. So if you could carry on and, and maybe even just touch again, I know we've talked about it a little bit about infusing the hope while this story was so heavy. Yeah. Um, so the first question about carrying on a character, um, I would love a book to be written about Tian. I don't know if I'm the right person to write it, but um, maybe it needs to be like an own voice book. Um, so when I, so I have Dolly is, is the main character and they also have Mei Lin, who is a Chinese girl who comes over as a paper daughter. So she is fictional, but I based her on true stories. So if you read the chapter notes, you'll see that pretty much everything she went through was based on someone else. But I really wanted to honor and respect um, those, those Chinese women and, and let them have you know, their own dignity. And so that's why I created that composite character. Um, I'd love to see a book written on, on Tian. Um, I think I, I wouldn't mind writing a second volume, but I would have to do a lot of research on the legal system because 
literally a lot of them were court cases. In fact, you can look some of them up online. There's a court case called Broken Blossoms case, and that was a really a huge breakout case, I think in 1936, which is kind of a tragedy in, your, in itself. This is still going on in the 30s and 40s. Um, anyway, and then, then the question about I'm kind of writing writing a book that um, could kind of be safe for an older teenager to, to read, um, as well as like making sure you kind of keep that balance of, of how can you write a book about this topic and have it inspirational. Um, I, I think one of my, so, so I, was, I was very cognizant of like what I put in. I didn't feel like I was trying to push up against the line, um, but I also was, a, was, I just felt really grateful and blessed when the committee read the book and they approved the book and they didn't ask for anything to be whitewashed um, that I had put in it. So, because I felt like they, they got, they understood the spirit of the book and the importance, like you said, to be real and to not, not whitewash the book um, as far as like take out things that might be too hard to read. Um, but I was also trying to make sure um, you, you know what's going on, but it doesn't have to be graphic to know what's going on. Um, I also appreciated that just from a, my own journey in publishing. Mm -hmm. I cheered the publisher. I cheered Shadow Mountain the whole time as well, because I know the dynamics of the independent publishers that we're working with, right? Yeah. And I also know that our audience in general, in very general terms, right? And yet I think we're, it, it said a lot to the fact that this is timely, even though it's the late 1800s into the early 1900s, right? That right. this is the story of our day, unfortunately. And yet, and yet it was a story of the past. And so right. I too was grateful that the publisher um, gave the green light for this story to be told this way. And, but really the praise goes to you, Heather, because as the, as the craft is being, um, unfolding, right. As a writer, right. You have to take the extreme and try to make it palpable for the reader and, and not overwhelm, but not skirt because it doesn't respect. I, I thought of all of the women whose stories will never be told yeah. that are given the privilege, I think, to watch this conversation today and watch your journey as the writer. And I know that they experience healing in my belief system. They did. And they were able to feel their story told and honored and heal. And I felt that so strongly. So thank you for being willing to do that. Because that healing, I just wondered of all of my friends that are of Chinese descent that I didn't have this conversation with. Like, I want to go back to high school because I grew up in this area and I was born in Sacramento. So the Sacramento Street reference every time, like it brought me home. And I just thought I have friends of Chinese descent that I wonder what their ancestors were part in the story. And I, I just honor them and honor you for, for your efforts of the heart and your creation and your skill and your craft is so beautiful. And I'm really grateful that you, you fought through the research to bring this story to life. So thank you, Heather. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm just grateful for this opportunity to talk more about Dolly Cameron and the amazing members at the mission home. I mean, I, I feel like their example to me and to us, is just something that we could hold up that it, this really happened. This is a true story. Um, and this isn't some little fluffy ideal out there. This was hard work. This is real work. And if there's, there's anything I take away from the book is just how can I now be a better person as far as being more compassionate, um, be more service oriented and um, hopefully at the end of my life, the bird's eye view will be, <laughs> will look like I maybe got through the Beatitudes too, <laughs> but I'm definitely a work in progress. <laughs> As we all are. I think that's a perfect ending. Thank you for all of you that joined us live for this conversation. And thank you, Heather, for your generosity of spirit. Thank you for 
uh, being patient with my tears. I'm grateful that this is a gathering of women as far as I can see so far that maybe validate and understand that that's a strength, but they, they often come out and as a professional, I try to keep it in check, but I felt like this story deserved the permission to cry together. And so I hope that those that joined us live will, I've seen many people comment about the fact that, um, they they are now excited to read it because they didn't know and that's exciting and those that had already read it i think it was therapeutic for them to have this conversation i know it has been for me because these characters are real and um and so thank you heather for filling in some gaps and piquing our interest and answering questions and, and we'll be excited to see the next of the heather be more creations that will be coming soon so Thanks, and Heather. Then, um, really quick, we're going to be giving away um, a copy of oh, but and also a copy of the Paper Daughters. And um, we are going. And there's a sign up, and it's open until four o'clock today for book plates. And that means that you can get a free book plate. And there, I should have had them in here. They're just um, stickers that go with the cover, and then I sign it. And then we'll mail it to you for free. So I'm excited about that. And you can just stick it in the front of your book when you get it. Wonderful. Wonderful. And um, thank you again for everyone that joined and share this. Because if we, if you have a few hours to invite your friends and family to enter in, it would be great to have them be part of the drawing as well. And we'll see you again here at the next Shadow Mountain Publishing virtual event. And thanks, Heather, again, sending you my love. I think it's only a few streets away that we are physically, but I'm still sending it through the StreamYard line. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much.